Okay, so we can start. So the, we were talking about the silo theorems. So we briefly call the statement. We had a um, <coughs> so a P zero group. So if G is a group of order uh, say P to the M times R, where uh, P and R are relatively prime, the uh, a P zero subgroup. Is a <coughs> is a subgroup H in G, whose order is the maximal possible power of P uh, P to the m, and uh, uh, so the first zero theorem says that such subgroups always exist. So. This is the first zero theorem, which says uh, uh, G has a P pseudo subgroup. Okay, and um, <coughs> so I will still, because we're using it a few times today, uh, recall the corollary the main first corollary, which is uh, uh, Cauchy's theorem. Which says that um, uh, if a prime P divides uh, the order of the group, then uh, the group contains an element of order P. So then we had made a few first applications. Um, and um, now I wanted to come uh, to the following, which I had not, uh, which I had just stated but not proved the last time. So this is the following theorem. So every group. I actually maybe have to be slightly careful about the statement than last time. So let P be a prime, which is at least three. So, um, uh, <coughs> then uh, every group. Well, maybe it's even okay. Of order two P is cyclic or diheter. So it means it's either equal to the cyclic group with two p elements or it's the diheter group uh, dp. And to I just again recall the statement the diheter group dn is a, a group of order 2n. with uh, the following two condition, which is generated by elements a, b, such that a to the n is equal to 1, b to the n, b squared is equal to 1, and a, um, so b, a, b, or b, a, b to the minus 1, whatever you want, is equal to a to the minus 1. And uh, you can easily see that these conditions allow you to uh, write down all the elements in the group. And so it's determined uniquely by this up to isomorphism. So let's try to prove this. <coughs> so.
So we will emit the use Cauchy's theorem. So this thing has two p elements. So in particular, p is a divisor. So so let G be our group of order two p. So <coughs> uh, by Cauchy's theorem, uh, there is an element of order p. So G contains an element which I call A of order P. And also B is a divisor, so it, uh, also 2 is a divisor of 2P, obviously, and an element B of order 2. OK. <coughs> so we look at the subgroup generated by this element of order P. So this has P elements. So as our group has uh, two P elements, we have that H is a normal subgroup. No, H has index 2. In, uh, in G. And it is a subgroup. So by an exercise, we find that it is a normal subgroup. So we have found this wonderful normal subgroup. <coughs> so therefore, if we write B A B, this is because B squared is equal to 1. This is the same as B A B to the minus 1. So this is the conjugation of A by some element in G, actually by B. So it follows that this must also lie, this, this lies, A lies in H. So also this thing must lie in H because H is a normal subgroup. So this is equal to A to the I for some I. No, because it lies in the subgroup H, which is generated by A. So <coughs> let's see what we can say about this I. So we can, for instance, do it twice. So we take B squared A B squared. This means we apply uh, B. Um, so Obviously, b squared is equal to so a is obviously equal to b squared a d squared because b squared is equal to 1. On the other hand, we can also view this as b, b, a, b, b. So this is equal to b, a to the i, b. And you can easily see as b squared is equal to 0, we can uh, write this also equal as b a, B to the I. No, you just write this I times next to each other. The, in, always between two factors, you have B squared, which is equal to 1. And so this is the same. So this is A to the I to the I. So this is A to the I squared. Yes. So if you write this, B A B times B A B. This is a B A B B A B, and this is equal to one. And so you just, uh, no. So in other words, we have. So it follows that A to the I squared minus 1, so if we multiply it, I squared minus 1 with itself, this is equal to 1. We just divide by A on both sides. Um, <coughs> now, we know H 
is a cyclic group of order p generated by a. So we know that uh, a to the a to some number is equal to 1 if and only if p divides that number. So a is order p, thus uh, we have, it follows that p divides i squared minus 1, which I can write as i plus 1 times i minus 1. And as um, p is a prime number, if it divides the product of two integers, it has to divide one of these two integers. So it follows, I maybe mean, right now it divides like this, p divides i plus 1, or p divides i minus 1. And now we want to look at these two cases. We will find that in one case the group is cyclic, in the other one it's dihedral. So let's see. So first look, uh, so if p divides i minus 1, what do we have? We have, and it means that a to the i minus 1 is equal to 1. So it means if we multiply by a, we get a to the i is equal to a. But that just means, you know, a to the i was b a b. So b a b, which is the same as b a b to the minus 1, is equal to a. So that means b a is equal to a b. So a and b commute. No, and as our group is generated, so let me see. So A and B commute. Anyway, so let's say not go too fast. Um, so, <coughs> so you, I mean, it follows, uh, so, <coughs> yeah, let me. So if A and B commute, you can say that, you know, obviously B is not in the subgroup generated by A. So it means that A and B generate G. Because if you uh, take, uh, so this contains already P elements. If you also add to it the element B and all the products with it, you get two P elements. So. So G is commutative. Because the two elements would generate what? Oh, hmm? I didn't get the word. You have to say speak louder. I don't know what you said. Uh -uh. So I mean, maybe it was a bit fast, but so we have H as a subgroup which has P elements. B does not lie in this subgroup. And uh, so therefore, uh, B, does not lie? B not, does not lie in H. You no, know, because P, B has order 2 and this has order P, and so it doesn't lie in that. So therefore, if we, <coughs> so the subgroup generated by A and B must have a order uh, at least 2 two times p. And so uh, we, uh, we find that it's generated by them. And these two elements commute, as we have seen, so g is commutative. Because you know you just write any word in a and b, and then uh, you can they commute. So we have a commutative. So it means, in particular, that uh, so thus we also have the group sub-generated by b is a normal subgroup. And we have that intersection of these two subgroups consists just of the unit element, because all elements 
different from the unit element here have order p, and all elements different from the unit element here have order 2. And uh, this cannot be the case for one element. <coughs> and also the group is gen and uh, <coughs> so we can uh, and by the argument I just give, gave, we have that if we take all products of elements in A and B, this gives the whole group. So we can apply this theorem we had before, which tells us that, so by previous theorem, which tells us under what conditions you get a product, uh, you have that this is the product of these two groups. We have a G is equal to A times B. But um, you know, this is uh, isomorphic to a cyclic group of order P. And this is isomorphic to a cyclic order group of order 2. And then if we want, we can uh, apply a previous theorem, which tells us if the two such numbers are relatively prime, in this case p and 2, then the product of these cyclic groups is equal to the cyclic group of the product order. And this is isomorphic to z modulo 2p z. So we find in this case it's a cyclic group. And this here we have used this, this case. We have the other case that p divides i plus 1. So, well, we just look what we have. So, that means, what? Yeah? So, then, it, that just means that A to the I plus 1 is equal to 1. So, in other words, if I divide by A, A to the I, is equal to a to the minus 1. So thus we find that b, a, b is equal to a to the minus 1. We already know uh, that uh, a to the p is equal to 1, that b squared is equal to 1, and we have assumed that the group has two p elements. And again, by the same argument as before, the group is generated by these two. So this is a, so we see that this is precisely the condition that characterizes the, the dihedral group. So the group is the dihedral group in P, in two p elements. So you know it's. DP. So it says the dihedral group DP has two P elements. Okay, so. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Well, we, in some sense, we can. I think we can already say it from the beginning, no? Because we have the. We have, an, we have a group of order 2p. We have an element, you know, regardless of the commutativity or anything like that. So if we have, um, so we have that A is a subgroup of order p, and we have b an element in the group, which is not in the subgroup. So <coughs> it means that you know that kind of the the other coset with respect to set to 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 this is so. Um, it really implies, so we have um, A has P elements. And uh, we have the group. <coughs> so, <coughs> and we have B is not in A. So we could make the, we can just look at the, the coset, uh, you know, the, the cosets for A. 
So, we have that uh, g uh, uh, is equal to uh, a plus b, so union b a. Now, these are the two cosets for this set. So, it means that actually every element can be written as an element as a power of a plus b times the power of a. So, in particular, the group is generated by a and b. This is independent of commutativity or anything. It's just by the fact that this thing has index 2 in the group, and we have found one element which does not lie in the group. Okay, so I didn't maybe explain this so properly, but it's a, it's a very simple fact. It doesn't uh, have anything to do with the rest. Is it clear? Yeah, that's true. So that's what I. Ah, why do we know it's a cyclic group a priori? It's, it's a cyclic group that uh, that is derived with the product of a b. Yeah, yeah, no, that's what I uh, what I deduced. Yeah, but you say you can see it more directly. Yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe you're right. Yeah, but I I don't quite see. What? Yeah, yeah. Oh. So if you just take, so you just say if you take the powers of AB, you can get all these elements. Yeah, okay, no, that is in some sense true. Yeah, if you just look at all the products and you see what you get, you find all the elements. That is true. Yeah, okay. Okay, so I, I, I needn't make such a complicated story, but uh, okay. Okay, so now we want to come to the second Silo theorem. Uh, which is um, a bit more complicated to state, um, but um, <coughs> so it says maybe something about how the different p groups and how the different uh, p silo subgroups are related to each other in some way by conjugation, and uh, so. So the, the second Silo theorem, theorem says in particular, so one kind of consequence of it, which is easier to, re to remember, that uh, all Silo subgroups are conjugated to each other. But uh, the precise formulation is, uh, it says somewhat more, which makes it also a bit more complicated. So this is the second Silo theorem. So what does it say? Let's say if we take any subgroup Uh, of G, uh, whose order is divisible by P. So let H be a, a P zero subgroup. of G, then there is a group which is conjugate to H such that the intersection of it with K is a P0 subgroup of K. So then there is a conjugate subgroup H prime equal to, say, G H G to the minus 1 of G, uh, such that 
uh, k intersect at h prime is a p0 subgroup. of k. So, when, so in particular, it somehow says how you can get p0 subgroups of subgroups by just taking a p0 subgroup of the big group, conjugating it, and taking the intersection. OK. So we want to give a couple of corollaries. <coughs> So first, let k um, g be a subgroup, which is a p group. So that means the number of elements is the power of p. Then k is contained in a, uh, in a p0 subgroup of g. So large k, obviously. OK, so you it will always be contained in a group with the maximal p power of elements. And the second one is the one I said before. So the p0 subgroups <coughs> of G are all conjugate I mean you should notice that if I have a p0 subgroup if I take a conjugate of it it will also be a subgroup and as a conjugation is a bijection. It also has p to the m elements, so it's also p zero subgroup. Okay. Now, so it certainly, if you so the, all the conjugates of p zero subgroups are p zero subgroups, and here we have the converse that the p zero, you know, you can get also get all the p zero subgroups as conjugates of just one of them. What what does maximum mean? It's it's not it, it's not contained in so it's the biggest possible p group no but you know there can be bigger subgroups I think. What? Yeah, but but that's kind of trivial anyway no because uh, this p zero group has the maximal power the maximum uh, p power of elements so there can be no other p group which is bigger because it, you know the, the maximum number which divides the the number of elements in the group is p to the to the m so that the maximality follows from you know just from the number of elements but it is true it's also maximal but it's you know <coughs> you see but it is a little bit like a statement you know that every uh, but everything is contained in it's it's maximal in the stronger sense that everything is contained in one of them so that's kind of uh, okay so now let's uh, first prove this uh, uh, corollary so <coughs> so i just write also down that uh, as a conjugation uh, um, from H to G, H, G to the minus one is a bijection. Um, we have that uh, a conjugate of a P0 subgroup is a P0 subgroup. Okay, so that I said before. Um, so let's 
start with the proof of one. So, so if K is a P sub is a P subgroup of G, so it's a P group, that means the number of elements is the power of P, a subgroup of K, and it's a subgroup of G. Um, then obviously, <laughs> kind of just by definition, uh, K is a P pseudo subgroup of itself. No, it's uh, you know contains the maximal p power of elements. No, that's kind of if you have a p group, it's a p zero subgroup of itself, kind of tautolog tautologically. So we ca can apply the theorem to this wonderful situation. So, so thus by the theorem, so the second zero theorem, if H is a pseudo uh, subgroup of G, then there is this conjugate and so on. So then there is a conjugate h prime equal to g h g to the minus 1 uh, such that um, if I take the intersection k intersected h prime then this is a p zero subgroup of of uh, of k, actually the unique p pseudo subgroup of k, because obviously the only p subgroup of k, the only p pseudo subgroup of k itself is k itself, because you know tests have all the elements. So, so is I could also write the un unique. So, <coughs> so this must therefore be equal to k, which is nothing else. Um, that K is a subgroup of H prime. And as H prime is a pseudo subgroup, we find that it, K is contained in it. So, which is, so H, H prime is a P pseudo subgroup. And so we find kind of by this trivial application that uh, this first one is true. Now let's look at the second. So we were right here containing K. So let's look at the second. So what is the statement? The P0 subgroups are all conjugate. So let's take two P zero subgroups. Of G. So then, then we can uh, uh, <coughs> then there exists a conjugate, say h prime equal to g h g to the minus 1 of h, which contains k. So this is by part 1. No, no k is a p group. And we have said that every p group is contained in well, actually, by the by the proof of 
part one. We just saw in, in the proof of part one, we have just taken, we have seen that uh, not only it is contained in a P0 subgroup, but, it, but for any given P0 subgroup, it's contained in a conjugate of that. No? And it's proof. So, but, um, so H contains K, but H has P to the M elements and K has P to the M elements, so they're equal. So H prime contains K, but uh, H prime contains K and the number of elements in H prime is equal to the number of elements in K, which is P to the M. So they are equal. So we find that indeed all P, all P zero subgroups are conjugate. So <clears throat> I want to, so this is a, yeah, this is a slightly complicated statement, but that's a, how it is, and uh, maybe the corollary, which which just says some special cases of it, is slightly easier to understand. I mean, to keep in mind. I want to directly go to the third zero uh, theorem and then give another application. So the <coughs> first zero theorem says that there are, are always p zero subgroups. The second one says in particular that they are all conjugate. And the third one says something about how many P0 subgroups there are. So third zero theorem tells you not quite completely how many there are, but at least gives you some idea, tells you something about how many uh, P0 subgroups there are. So the statement is the following. Um, so again, so I repeat the usual uh, assumptions that we have that G was a finite group of order P to the M times R, where R, where P does not divide R. Uh, yes. Um, so let S be the number of P pseudo subgroups. And we can say something about this number. We can say two things. Namely, then S, this number of P0 subgroup, divides the number R. So the, the rest here. And S is congruent 1 modulo P. So it's, uh, you know, S can be. Uh, so it has con these two conditions. It's a divisor of R, and um, <coughs> it is, um, it has the property that if you divide, take the rest of division by P, you get one. So this is a rather strong restriction. So in particular, if the numbers, if uh, the numbers P and R are somehow not too large. Very often, this will be almost impossible to fulfill or it will force S to be 1 or something. So let's uh, give an application of this um, where one actually precisely uses that. And this is um, another uh, characterization of uh, many, I mean, at 
classification of many groups, which uh, <clears throat> so the statement is let uh, this whole theorem let G be a group. of order um, so G which is equal to P times Q where P and Q are primes P is bigger than Q and P and Q are primes so we have two prime numbers P and Q one is bigger than the other and in addition we have so if Q does not divide the number p minus 1, then g is cyclic. So we have a, so if we have this kind of, so for quite a number of possible number of elements of, uh, of the group G, we can completely say what the group is up to isomorphism. So just so this is true, for instance, uh, if we take, uh, if the order of group is equal to 15, 33, uh, 35, and, you know, hope 35 is correct, yeah, and so on. So there are many cases. Okay, so let's try to prove this. And this actually is an application mostly of the third Silo theorem. So we take uh, NP to be the number of P Silo subgroups. So we have these two primes, no? And P equal to the number of P pseudo subgroups of G. I want to find out what this is. We know that by the third Silo theorem, we have that NP is congruent to one modulo P. And um, what? So yeah, okay. I I wrote number the number symbol, but number of. I mean, sometimes one just writes this to mean number, but maybe I shouldn't. At least not without warning you. <coughs> so N P is congruent one mod p and it's supposed to be a divisor of q no but p is bigger than q so if it's congruent to one mod p and the divisor of q it must be one because if it would be already p plus one it would be it cannot be a divisor of q because it would be bigger than q so and and p divides, I write it now like this, uh, Q. So as P is bigger than Q, it follows that NP is equal to 1. So there's only one uh, P0 subgroup. So, but we know that all p silo subgroups, so, so all p silo subgroups are conjugate to each other. And also if you conjugate, uh, if you take the conjugation of a p silo subgroup by some element, so if you take an, apply an element to a p silo subgroup, you, via conjugation, you get another p, you get a p silo subgroup. So it follows, so if uh, g, is an element in G, then G 
h g to the minus one is it so so let let h be the unique p pseudo subgroup a bit too high then if g is in g then we have g h g to the minus one is also p zero subgroup but there's only one so this must be equal to h so it means that h is a normal subgroup so we see that if there's only one p zero subgroup it always has to be a normal subgroup okay and now we want to uh, <clears throat> so this is in this actually we have done by applying the second well not really and now um, let's look at uh, the number in q to the number of q zero subgroups we will want to show that this is also this number is also one in by similar argument so we know that uh, nq is equal is congruent to 1 mod q and um, is it correct yes and um, p divides the number no and nq divides p and q divides p but now <coughs> um, so uh, So NQ has to divide P. So P has only two divisors, namely 1 and P. So it follows is equal to 1 or NQ is equal to P. Only two possibilities. So we want to see that NQ is equal to 1. So we want to see that this is not possible. So if NQ is equal to P, we know that NQ is congruent to 1 mod P. So then P is congruent to 1 mod P, mod Q, obviously. Sorry for the misprints. And so it means that Q divides P minus 1, which is precisely what we have excluded here. No, we have excluded it precisely because we didn't want this to happen. So thus it follows that NQ is equal to 1. So this is a contradiction. And so NQ is equal to 1. And so <clears throat> now the number of Q0 subgroups is also equal to 1. By the argument we have made before, it means that there is a, the, the unique Q zero subgroup is a normal subgroup. K of G is a normal subgroup. So note that you know these are so we know H is uh, isomorphic to Z mod. Uh, PZ, 
because it is a group with p elements and every group with p elements is cyclic and uh, k is uh, isomorphic to z mod qz in particular <coughs> You know, every element in this thing which is different from 1 has order p. Every element in this one which is different from 1 has order q. So we find that uh, h intersected k consists only of the one element. And uh, <coughs> so <coughs> we can apply a previous theorem, although maybe we have to explain a little bit. We had this theorem which said that um, if we have a group and we have two normal subgroups, uh, whose intersection is 1 and kind of if you take the product of any of them it's the whole of the group you get uh, that the group is the product of these two normal subgroups but if you look at the proof um, we had shown that the map from the product to the group is injective uh, is a homomorphism it is injective and uh, we use the fact <coughs> and uh, and subjective. So for the injectivity, we used only this, and for the fact that it was well defined. Only for the subjectivity, we used that every element in the group is a product of one element of one of the other. But here we have that the number of elements in the product of the group is p times q. So we have an injective map from h times k to our an injective homomorphism from H times K to our group G, which must be bijection because they have the same number of elements. So this means they are isomorphic. So I should maybe have stated that when I uh, did the previous theorem, as you also kind of hinted <laughs> in some sense. But uh, anyway, <coughs> so it follows uh, by previous theorem. and its proof. I will uh, that um, uh, the G is equal to H times K. Huh? So if you have this, we had this thing, if you have two normal subgroups of a group with this property, then G is the product. So <coughs> that means that is equal to ZP Z mod P times Z mod Q, which uh, as P and Q are two different primes, is isomorphic to Z mod P Q. P Q Z. Okay. So, okay, so this uh, is the last. Uh, application we want I want to make so what you can see is that at least if the group is not too big this fact uh, these zero theorems can actually tell you quite a lot about the group so that in many cases you can actually find out precisely what the group is um, but one has to be slightly if you look at it in all our cases we somehow always had assumed that the number of elements in the group has very few prime factors and it kind of gets not so nice anymore and you cannot say so much or so easily when uh, you have a for instance some high power of a prime for instance we do not know what the groups of order 8 are it's not so difficult but we from what we have said we don't know it and uh, or 16 or 12 whatever okay so now Obviously, I will have to prove these theorems, the zero theorems. Okay, so I have made all these applications. So somehow, you might want to be sure that the theorems are actually true. So let's start with the proof of the first zero theorem. Much. Uh -huh. So we start with the elementary lemma.
which is not really about group theory, but just about integers or about counting things. So, so the number of subsets of order p to the m, so with p to the m elements of a set with, um, say, n equal to p to the m times r elements, where p does not divide r, is uh, given as follows. Well, this has nothing to, actually, this is independent of this assumption. So n choose p to the m, which is n times n minus 1 until n times minus p to the m plus 1 divided by p to the m times p to the m minus 1 minus 1 and so on. So the typical element will be p to the k minus p to the m minus k for some k and so on until we finally end with 1. So everybody knows these binomial coefficients and you know I hope that they can be defined as the number of subsets so n choose m is equal to the number of subsets of m elements of a set of n elements so or the number of subsets of uh, m elements of the numbers from 1 to n so this is uh, more or less how it comes up if you if you look at the binomial formula, it comes precisely up by counting these. So this is standard. So this is, um, this I'm not going to prove, but the, because I consider it as standard, but the non-trivial, the new thing is that furthermore, P does not divide M. This number N. So the binomial coefficient is not divisible by P. Okay, so <clears throat> let's prove this. As I said, the first one is elementary, and I will not uh, end well known. So that proof that uh, uh, that this number that this number of uh, subsets is this binomial coefficients is well known. And you know, sometimes one does it even in school. So, um, so we have to show only this last thing, that P does not divide N. P does not divide N. So here we just have to look at these factors. What I'm claiming is that you can, whenever some power of P divides a factor here, it divides with the same power the corresponding factor here. So, for instance, here, obviously, p to the m divides this one, but p to the m also divides this, and it's the highest power of p which divides it. So there's no power of p which occurs here. And you can see that it goes on like this, so let me write it. So, so the claim is Whenever, or maybe this is the note, whenever P to the L divides N minus K, um, then also P to the L divides P to the M minus k, and vice versa.
is this just because n is equal to p to the m times r. So it will, the same power of p which divides this, if you take the highest power of p which divides n or n minus anything, namely because this is if and only if, because this is uh, the maximal power of p that divides k. No? So the maximum power of p, my maximum power of p which divides this difference is the same as the, you know, in, in this range as when p k goes from 1 to p to the m minus 1, the maximal power of k which divides n minus k and the maximal power of p which divides p to the m minus k is precisely the maximum power of p which divides k. Because k is a number from 1 to p to the m, and so the <coughs> so it will always, this is already the highest power of m of p which is possible, so this is this. Okay. So, so just say it again. So the maximum power, maximum. You know, I have written it before, but it's uh, written in a slightly strange way. The maximum power of p, which divides n minus k. So for k, k is an element from zero to p to the m minus one. So maximum power which divides this is equal to the maximum power of p. which divides k. And this is also equal to the maximal power of p, which divides p to the m minus k. So we see that in this thing, whenever something above is divisible by some power of p, of p, the thing which lies is directly below it is divisible by the same power of p. And so we can just cancel it out, and there's no factor of p left over. And so it's not divisible by so the whole thing. So thus, p does not divide n. So um, now. Now let's try start the proof of the theorem. And this is um, done in a with a strange trick, which is quite remarkable. I don't know how one can come up with it. So we take so <coughs> obviously somehow you can. Um, want to apply this, so we take S to be the set of all subsets M of G, such that M has precisely P to the M elements. So M is a subset, not a subgroup, of G of order with P to the m elements. We know that the number n we have introduced here 
is just equal to the number of elements in S. So now we want to, you know, <coughs> we let G act on it by uh, left multiplication. So G acts on S via left multiplication. So, you know, you have pair G and G, and some M, you know, is mapped to G M. You know, just every element in G, which, uh, as you know, is a set of all G M M in M. Obviously, in left multiplication is a bijection, so it res respects the number of elements, so it acts on the set S. And we can, so we have this action, so G can be decomposed into disjoint orbits. So, thus, so we can decompose S into disjoint orbits into the orbits just write the orbits with respect to this action so we have s is a you know a union of disjoint unions a, a, a union of um, these disjoint orbits so we have the number of elements in s is the sum of the number of elements in the orbit. So we have the number n, which was s, is equal to the sum over all orbits for this action, which the orbit I call O, uh, the number of elements in O. So O orbits for left multiplication. Okay. We know that P does not divide N. That was after the lemma. P does not divide N. So in particular, so if for all orbits, the number of elements in the orbit would be divisible by P, then P would have to divide N. So there must be some orbit who's, such that the number of elements is not divisible by P. So thus, there is an, an orbit uh, O, which is the orbit of some subset M, such that uh, the number of elements that P does not divide the number of elements in the orbit. confused. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay, so my <laughs> proposition above. Yeah, now I'm, maybe you can remind me which proposition that is. I say the number of elements in the st stabilizer of M is a power of P.
Is that obvious to you? <laughs> it should be, even though it's not in the moment obvious to me. Question is which proposition that is. This is the wrong one. This is also the wrong one. So maybe as I in the moment well, I should at least what how much time do I have? Hmm. We make one attempt to find out what the statement is. Uh, so does somebody remember which proposition I'm using here? Can make this an exercise, uh, an, you know, an exam question. So <laughs> who is smarter than me? Okay. So um, yeah, obviously I don't have my my notes, so I cannot look for it. So, anyway, so I think I will have to to leave this for the moment, to, and I will tell you uh, next time why the order of this. It's a bit annoying. <coughs> I don't even have the notes. No, I cannot. What? What? What does the proposition say? No, what does it say? It says that uh, a D act uh, on itself by by left translation. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, so that's the point. Yeah, obviously, I should have remembered that. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, um, uh, so you, so the statement is that, um, so if we have, um, um, so the proposition, which uh, all of you remembered very well, <laughs> um, was that uh, if um, uh, G acts on uh, on itself by uh, left multiplication um, then the order uh, and m is some element is a subset of g then the order of the stabilizer of the subset divides uh, the number of elements in M. Okay, so we, that was uh, obviously the result we used because we have uh, we are looking here at subsets M whose order is P to the M. So we must have that the order of the stabilizer um, divides P to the M, so it is a power of P. Thank you. So you managed to help me out. <coughs> I hope I have still my notes. Yeah. So now we apply the orbit stabilizer theorem. which says that the number of elements in G, which we know to be P to the M times R, is uh, equal to the number of elements in the stabilizer times the number of elements in the orbit. 
Now, we know that P does not divide the number of elements in the orbit. So as P does not divide the number of elements in GM, because this was, after all, this was the number n, which we have found not to be divisible by P, it follows that, uh, so, <coughs> you know, as this thing, so the, on the other hand, this must be a number of, uh, so if uh, the number of elements here is a power of P, it must be the highest possible power of P, it must be P to the M. It follows the number of elements in GM is equal to P to the R. Now, the stabilizer is always a subgroup, so it, uh, P to the M, obviously. So it follows that GM is a P0 subgroup. of G. It's a bit, it's a very funny proof to construct this group in this very roundabout way. But uh, anyway, <coughs> it's not supposed to be an easy result. So one has to have a kind of strange shape. It's somehow rather sneaky. I don't know how. <laughs> anyway, so it is, uh, so it is, you know, also you seem to be talking about something completely different all the time. And in the end, uh, this group comes out. <coughs> Okay, so um, now uh, we will try to prove the second zero theorem. So maybe uh, I hope you remember the statement. Second so uh, the statement was that if you have a, a so you have your G is your group, if you have a subgroup K, then you can f uh, and if you also have a, 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 a P0 subgroup of the big group, then you find, can find a conjugate of this P0 subgroup that the intersection with K is a P0 subgroup of uh, K. So let's try to do that. So let uh, K be a subgroup. of uh, G and H, the P0 subgroup of G. We have to show that there exists uh, a conjugate H prime equal to G H G to the minus one such that um, uh, H prime intersected K is a P0 subgroup of K. Okay, let's try to do that. So we look at the set of left cosets for H. So let S equal to G mod H be the set of left cosets. Um, obviously, G acts transitively tran let me write it better tran C on the set on G mod H by left multiplication. Mm. 
No, you just, uh, no, you can just, if you start with the, this, with h, 1 times h, you can get every g times h by multiplying by some element in g. And um, so just g times uh, a times h is equal to g a h. No, that's the action. And um, the stabilizer for this action of the element 1 times h, which is just h, is h itself. No? If you multiply an element in h with something which is not in h, you are, get outside h. And if you multiply it with something in h, as h is a subgroup, you stay in h. So the stabilizer of this thing for this action is precisely h. And uh, you can see from this quite easily, so you can see that the stabilizer of, uh, if I take the group, uh, the coset AH is precisely uh, AHA to the minus 1. No, you can easily see that um, if you multiply an element in AH with AH e to the minus 1, you are again in AH. And it's easy to see that it's the only way how you can do that. I mean, anyway, it's uh, easy to see that the stabilizers, if you move the element, the corresponding stabilizers are conjugate to each other. Anyway, so this, if you want, is an exercise, but it's kind of obvious. Now we want to restrict this action to uh, the subgroup K of G. So I mean, the group that operates is no longer G, but K. So we have now. The action is now from k times uh, g mod h to g mod h. No? k times a h is k times a h. Okay. And we want to decompose g mod h into orbits for this action. to k orbits. Before, if we took the g action on this thing, it's, tr it's transitive, so there's only one g orbit. But now we take a smaller group, there might be more orbits. So as you know, h is supposed to be a p pseudo subgroup, So it follows that uh, the number of elements in H is, you know, is p to the m. So the number of elements in G mod R, is G mod H is therefore the corresponding uh, number of elements in G divided by p to the m. So this is not divisible by p. It's actually, you know, you know that. Uh, so is p so we know that uh, the number s number of elements in G mod H is prime to P. So it's not divisible by P. Because after all, <coughs> you know, we had that the number of elements in G is equal to P 
to the m times r. The number of elements in H is equal to p to the m. And by the whatever Lagrange theorem, we have that uh, the number of elements in G mod H so is equal to r, which is not divisible by p. So therefore, it's kind of the same trick as before. So therefore, there is, um, uh, you know, we decompose it into orbits. We have again that the number of elements in S is equal to sum of the elements in the orbits. And so therefore, there must be one orbit such that the number of elements is not divisible by P. orbit. So k times a h. So on g mod h such that number of elements in k times a h is prime to p not divisible by p. So we put H prime equal to A H A to the minus 1. We have seen here that this is precisely the stabilizer of, uh, in G of, uh, of this A H. So then H prime is the stabilizer is equal to G A H is the stabilizer in uh, G. And um, now instead we look at the stabilizer for uh, the K action. But you know, a stabilizer is an element which does not move this A H. If we take the stabilizer inter inside the subgroup, it's precisely the set of all elements in the subgroup which are in the stabilizer here, no? because it's still the, the elements which do not move it. So it follows that um, the stabilizer uh, so I call this could call this for the action of k a h is h prime intersected k. And um, again by the orbit stabilizer theorem, We have that the number of elements in the orbit times the number of elements in. So we have that uh, let's see, the number of elements in K times A H times the number of elements in the stabilizer is equal to the number of elements in the group which acts, which in this case is K. <clears throat> but we know that the number of elements in the orbit is prime to p. p does not divide uh, the number of elements in k of a h in the orbit here. So the <coughs> If the highest power of p, which divides the number of elements in k, will divide the number of elements in the stabilizer. 
this. So if we write the number of elements in K equal to, say, P to the S times L, then Um, then p to the s divides the number of elements in uh, the stabilizer. On the other hand, you know we know that h prime is a p group. After all. It is a p. It is a p subgroup of G. So the number of elements is a power of p. So it has a p to the m elements. And um, this stabilizer uh, is a, a subgroup of H prime. So it means that the number of elements in this thing is divisible by p. Is a power of p. No, it's a it's a, a divisor of p to the m. So we see that the num this uh, this thing is a p group whose number of elements is the maximal possible one for a p group the maximal power of p, so it is a p pseudo subgroup. K A H, K -A -H which is equal to H prime intersected K, is a p pseudo subgroup. And this was the statement of the second zero theorem. OK, maybe this time I went slightly over. So I uh, will stop here. <coughs>